Now let's get started by introducing my esteemed group of colleagues. Tim Wasserman is the Program Director for the Stanford Advanced Project Management Program and Chief Learning Officer for IPS Learning. He is responsible for developing and managing the Stanford Advanced Project Management Curriculum through the dynamic partnership of Stanford University's School of Engineering and IPS Learning's global team of practitioners. Tim has been with the program for over seven years, te teaching both on Stanford's campus and internationally for clients like Qualcomm, Boeing, Cisco, Pratt & Whitney, and Eaton Aerospace. As Chief Learning Officer, he's also responsible for the IPS Learning product portfolio. He has over 25 years' experience developing, developing and implementing enterprise-wide solutions to address the human capital needs of global Fortune 500 companies. He's also designed and implemented large-scale customized learning and consulting engagements in areas such as project and program management, leadership development, talent development, retention management, new employee assimil assimilation, creativity and innovation, and quality methodologies. Welcome, Tim. Joining Tim today will be Ismail al -Bhaitani. Ismail is the head of distance learning, organization, and human performance at the International Air Transport Association's Training and Development Institute. He leads IATA's industry professional development programs in the aviation, cargo, travel, and tourism sectors, which are delivered to over 25,000 industry specialists and students every year from IATA headquarters in Montreal, Canada. In addition to his role at IATA, Ismail is a member of the supervisory board of the University of Geneva Aviation Management MBA, and the Stanford Aviation Management Certificate. He also lectures on strategy and project management at the University of Geneva and um, for ITDI in several locations. Welcome, Ms. Neal. And with that, I would like to turn uh, the presentation over to Ismail. Thank you, Carissa. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, wherever you are around the world. It's uh, indeed our pleasure to welcome you to this webinar to talk about a very important subject. Uh, I will start by talking about the aviation gap, uh, sharing with you the sense of urgency we live in this industry almost every day. At the beginning of this month, I attended an important conference organized by uh, the International Civil uh, Aviation Organization, which is the United Nations Body for Civil Aviation in Montreal, Canada. The conference gathered some key aviation and academic stakeholders from around the world to try uh, defining the aviation profession main competencies, um, trying to discuss how best the human capital of this industry can be developed, but most importantly, share ideas on how best we can actively reach out to the next generation of aviation professionals, to communicate with them about the wide range of career possibilities in the aviation industry. But some, some of you may ask why developing the human capital competency and reaching out to the next generation of this industry are suddenly becoming so important. Uh, and to answer this question, let me share with you some important facts. According to, um, according to the 2010 workforce study by the Aviation Week magazine, the study found that in the larger companies surveyed, those with more than 100,000 employees, more than 30% of the workforce would be eligible to retire in 2012. And the percentage reached to about 40% by 2014. So, so the talent gap in the industry could be particularly severe in view of the expected wave of retirement within the industry, which is something that has been looming for years. Airbus Global Market Forecast for 2010-2029 estimates that almost 26,000 new passenger jetliners and freighters will be needed to meet the rising demand for flight services. Boeing, on the other hand, reports that the world GDP and airline traffic are both expected to experience positive growth in the next 18 years. In particular, the growth rate of airline traffic is forecasted to exceed that of the world economy by 1.8%. 
You also see in the slide that Boeing has forecasted uh, between 2008 and 2028 that the world economy, GDP, will grow by 3.1%. Airplane fleet will grow by 3.2%. Number of passengers by 4.1%. Airline traffic, represented by the passenger kilometer, will grow by 4.9%. And cargo traffic will grow by 5.4%. So naturally, the airline and airport industries too would need an adequate talent pipeline to maintain efficiency and excellence in the face of the explosion in the demand for their services. So the sense of urgency is there. It's very evident that we have an existing severe shortage of competent human resource in the air transport industry. In this presentation, we will try, with the help of Stanford, one of the world's top universities, to form a competency model in connection with our air transport industry priorities. This is an important step at the right direction, and it's my pleasure to hand over to Tim Witherman uh, from Stanford, who will walk us all through the main competency pillars. Thank you, Ishmael. And uh, it's not just a significant talent gap, of course, as Ishmael has uh, pointed out, but also a potential leadership gap. And in order to, to meet this gap, really to have enough future leaders in the pipeline ready to assume the leadership roles when called upon, Stanford and IATA have looked at identifying the key management skills and competencies that are particularly critical in the face of not only today's challenges, but the challenges in the years ahead. And really, in order to close this gap, what are some things that can be done today as well as in the future? Leadership, when asked, is leadership uh, an art or is it a science? Think of leaders that you know, that you've observed, that you've had the opportunity to work with. What makes them effective? You know, often we hear things like they're charismatic, there's an aura about them, they have a dynamic personality. Uh, some might describe these intangibles as the art of leadership. Uh, these are important, and what we know from extensive research on leadership conducted both here at Stanford and throughout the world is that much of leadership is also a science, one that can be studied and it can be learned. And most importantly, successful leaders understand how to apply these competencies and skills once identified to the context or the environment in which the leader exists, in which they live, in which they work. Today, as Ishmael has mentioned, we wish to share some of the insights into these competencies that we feel are critical to address. There are many critical competencies. Five areas in particular that we've identified to focus on, these groupings that have the greatest impact, if you will, on execution effectiveness, especially in an environment where project-based work is required to obtain organizational results, and arguably most work that gets done in all of our organizations are based on a series of efforts, initiatives, or projects that require cross-organizational teams, cross-industry teams, uh, cross-geographic locational teams in order to work together. And those leadership areas that we want to focus on are, as a large grouping, leadership, strategy, decision-making, innovation, and execution. So let's take a look at the leadership grouping, if you will. And when we talk about this leadership grouping, one of the ways to define this is how we guide and motivate others to work together towards a common goal. Four of the key competencies that are particular, of particular importance, particularly in the environment we're faced, uh, one being vision, uh, the ability to lead the change that invariably comes as a response to the competitive environment we're all operating in. That work, as previously mentioned, really takes place through teams. And finally, communication leadership is particularly critical because we know that regardless of the vision, regardless of the, the leadership capability, our ability to communicate that, to help make the linkages, to articulate the vision, to, to motivate our people, and to really drive them towards results 
is critical and communication is a key element. Now, before we, uh, uh, one of the things that, that we'd like to do is to look at some examples that really reinforce the importance not only of these competencies, but really is a, a competency in action example. And in the area of leading with vision, not only recognizing the importance of it, but how it can be communicated. Ishmael, share with us uh, one particular example. Sure. Um, I will pick from where you ended, Tim. And, and let me start by saying leadership in our industry is about coping with the constant challenges we, we always face almost on a daily basis in this industry. So the interesting thing about the air transport industry is that it's positively uh, linked with the world development, as, as you saw in my introductory statistics. Uh, but also, the industry is so fragile and sensitive to all the different crises. All of us fly, all of us are passenger, and we know how the industry almost collapsed when the H1N1 virus uh, appeared. The volcanic ash in Europe stopped almost the whole economy and, and passengers from flying throughout Europe. Uh, different political and economical crises uh, are very, very uh, uh, linked to our industry. With this in mind, the airlines begin to envision the future of the industry in almost 40 years from now, by 2050. The example I would like to share with you here is a uh, a vision that uh, almost all airlines from around the world is trying to articulate in order to have an industry that eliminates queues with integrated system ensuring security as we process more passengers, um, an industry that is very near to zero accidents, an industry that emit half the carbon dioxide, an industry that operates with almost no delays in global United skies. Uh, an industry that shares cost and profits equitably across the value chain. And finally, an industry that delivers value to investors. But this is more of a dream uh, with a deadline uh, by 2050. Let me elaborate further on how the airlines will lead the way to 2050. There are four cornerstones that have been agreed as, uh, as uh, key elements to articulate this vision. The first cornerstone is the customer, the passenger. The customer is at the center of the future vision by 2050. We will have 16 billion travelers and handle 400 million tons of cargo. In just a couple of decades, we will see the middle class nearly triple from the 1.3 billion today to 3.5 billion people, a quarter of which will be in India and China. Accommodating that growth efficiently will be a challenge for all parts of the value chain. Airports, air navigation service providers, manufacturers, and even governments. The solution must be strategic and aligned. The second cornerstone is profitability. Efficiency gains never make it to the bottom line because airlines are uh, deprived of the commercial freedom to operate their businesses like a normal business. Our poor profitability makes every shock a fight for survival. The industry hyperfragmentation with about 1,061 airlines as a result of the bilateral system which regulates the global aviation industry. The restriction on international capital also prevent consolidation across borders. The third quarter cornerstone is infrastructure. Infrastructure must be reshaped around the needs of airlines. The core of the industry value chain, airport should compete for airline business based on efficiency. Commercial revenues will drive their business. We can see airports paying airlines to bring shoppers and airports revenue funding their traffic management system. Air traffic management must also change. We can see 10 global air navigation service providers replacing the current about 180 at half the cost. An example is the single European sky, as you may know, 
would be the first of the 10 global air navigation service providers. But this needs real leadership to replace today and coordinated, I would call it, bureaucratic mess. The uh, fourth uh, uh, cornerstone is, is about powering the industry. We cannot just continue on growing with more dependencies on fuel. We see what's happening around the world. Today's jet fuel cannot sustain air transport in the long term. We must find a sustainable alternative, and our most promising opportunity is biofuels, which have the potential to reduce our carbon footprint by up to 80%. After successful testing by airlines, certification is expected within a year, and this requires strong support and leadership from the industry and governments. Investing in biofuel and green technologies, local production with Jatrofa, uh, Jatrofa, uh, camelina, uh, algae, or even urban waste will open up economic opportunities in virtually any location. Not only will this secure a future power source for our industry, this will also break the uh, tyranny of oil and drive economy development in all parts of the world. So, as you can see, the best way for our industry to predict its future is to build it. And through these four cornerstones, uh, and the collaborative work between the airlines and regulators, we believe that we could shape the industry by the year 2050. Therefore, leadership with a strong and clear vision is a must. Uh, Tim, I hand over back to you. Ishmael, it, it's a powerful vision that you've shared, and how will we get there is the obvious next question. And the how, the how is the strategy. Strategy Competencies that are critical for identifying and implementing strategy include insight, and not just a gut reaction, but really scanning the environment, understanding, gathering data, informing your strategy, and with that, using that to plan, to create policy, and ultimately ensure alignment as you look to operationalize that strategy. It's really an iterative process of sharing your strategy throughout your organization, across your industry, and ensuring that feedback loops are in place so that you can iterate. Now, strategy, you know, a good strategy provides a clear roadmap. It consists of a set of guiding principles or rules. It defines actions people in the organization should take or not take. A good strategy directs the organization to prioritize activities, to prioritize investments, all focused towards achieving desired goals and results. And strategy drives the portfolio process. And by portfolio process, we mean a decision process that results in which projects, which initiatives, which efforts an organization will invest in, which resources will be applied to those, and at what time those will be applied. When we reflect on this, you know, the leader's role in strategy is, is not a simple role, but it's rather clear. With, whether it's senior leadership, who in most organizations really is chartered with defining the organization's vision, reflecting on its values, and demonstrating personal commitment, it's all le levels of leaders in the organizations who are responsible for not only demonstrating that commitment, but continually communicating it to identify the unique position, the key objectives and activities, and translating that, we, we refer to that as, a, as the alignment that's critical. It's one thing to have a clearly articulated strategy. It's another to link that strategy to what people are accountable for and responsible for on a daily basis. The ability of a leader to effectively create this linkage helps keep individuals focused. It's also critical for leaders to recognize that in this dynamic and global environment we're all operating in, there's not only a willingness to change course if necessary, but as we do that, we're using metrics, we're measuring our progress, and those drive our decision-making. And we're going to talk a bit more about decision-making shortly because that's another critical key area of competence that leaders need to develop. But ultimately, using that data to drive operational improvements and really create a differentiating approach so that we can be effective into the future. Thank you, Tim. So, indeed. The vision was almost a dream with a deadline. Uh, 
the, the question we, we always face and confront in this industry is how. How, how can we do it? The strategy is a real core competency in our industry, and I would like to share with you an example of um, how the industry strategizes around a key uh, priority for the industry, that is safety. Um, airlines are focusing, among other strategic initiatives, uh, to safety management systems and training, because deficient safety management was a factor in 23% of all incident or accidents in 2009. Flight crew training was a factor in 20% of all accidents. Uh, crew training was a factor in 58% almost of all long uh, floated or bounced landing in 2009, which represents about 35% of all runway exertions. Therefore, the airlines defined a safety strategy is based on safety program developed in a teamwork between the airline and the industry strategic partners with a focus on areas affecting operational safety like flight and cabin operations, ground handling, air traffic management, and cargo handling. In strategy planning, data is powerful, as Tim was mentioning. The airlines, along with three governmental aviation safety organizations, signed an agreement to launch the uh, Global Safety Information Exchange. Creating a comprehensive global information exchange to improve safety, it is uh, the most ambitious private-public private safety partnership in the aviation history. Uh, to formalize the strategic framework, IATA, uh, representing the airlines, together with the International Civil Aviation Organization, the United Nations body, that represents the regulators. Uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation uh, have, the three have signed uh, this memorandum of understanding um, with the European uh, Union, the Commission of the European Union, uh, to create the framework and pass forward to launch the Global Safety Information Exchange. Overall, the outcome of the safety management strategy is very encouraging. Let, let me share with you uh, some of the results of, from the benefits of strategizing in our industry. The, the total number of, of accidents decreased by 17%, 90 versus a, a 109 in 2008. Uh, Western Belt jet hull loss uh, rate it decreased by 12%. And the total number of uh, fatal accidents decreased by 22%. So uh, through strategy planning, the industry is able to address uh, one of its major concerns, that is safety. Uh, Tim, I think this is an example I have about uh, the use of strategy and how this competency is important in our industry. And, I, and I'm sure, as you rightly mentioned, uh, other competencies such as decision making are important, and, and I give it to you to introduce that core competency. Uh, absolutely, thank you, Ishmael. I think it's apparent to all of us when we consider the, the complexity of the safety program across industry, across government, across various functional operational areas. We as leaders are often handed a strategy and are asked to execute on it, and there are critical competencies and skill sets that are required to operationalize that and really drive to be able to achieve the results that you shared. When we talk about the area of decision-making competencies, we're really focusing on those critical decisions that not only help uh, you know, uh, uh, um, take conflicting goals and find ways to find commonality amongst those, not only addressing risk, but really good, solid uh, decision-making, even if it's not a contentious uh, situation, requires analysis, it requires research, it requires really understanding the context in which the strategy has been identified, and we refer to it on this particular slide as market sense, but it's really the larger environment in which you're operating. So when we think about decision-making, just, just real quickly, um, you know, as leaders, there's different types of decisions that we face. Uh, one, one of the areas that we, we talk to and, and teach to in the program has to do with different levels of decision making. 
you know, there are re reflex decisions, those kinds of decisions that are in the moment that we face every day. How will I spend my time? What meetings will I attend? They also can be things that come up very quickly, uh, a customer crisis. You know, our culture, our organizational perspective, the support we have drives those kinds of decisions. Uh, the next level that we refer to is, the, is conscious decisions, and, and those take uh, are impacted both by time. Uh, they tend to take a bit longer. They're important, but they may be easy, or they may be difficult, but not as important. But when we talk about conscious decisions, they're decisions that we typically have developed tools and processes to support those that are proven over time, and they uh, recognize certain uh, traps or challenges that we typically face whether we're thinking about how to determine funding, how and which ideas to execute and when, uh, whether we're looking at operational issues, how to handle a, a power outage in a terminal, we typically tend to have approaches that have been predetermined, been tested, uh, checklist-driven, if you will, that uh, can be effective means for decision-making. The, the most rigorous and, and in terms of duration, long-term, ongoing, and complex types of challenges we face the types of challenges that we'll continue to face as we look at achieving this vision and the strategy for the industry. Those really are significant issues that take in-depth exploration and rigor. And in the face of these types of decisions, it's critical that we have an agreed upon process. One of the processes that, that we focus on is uh, really around the notion of making a, a quality decision. And what we've found through extensive research is that it's as critical to start, it's, it's critical that these six different factors, these six elements are considered for these very complex decisions. And they're only as good as their weakest link. It's, it's an iterative process. We're validating each step of the way with committees, with sponsors, with key stakeholders. But it's critical that we explore each of those. Uh, very quickly, uh, it, it really begins with the appropriate frame. What is it we're deciding? We often look at a problem, and there's a, a, a high degree of disagreement even about how we articulate and frame that problem. And it's critical to get the appropriate people together who are going to be working on this problem and agree to that frame. Uh, next is looking at alternatives. You know, what are our choices? What are different creative but doable alternatives. Uh, often organizations look at uh, blue sky, uh, kind of a creative, open your mind and, and, and don't be constrained by what's doable. That's a very effective and creative process, but there is a point during the second, se second uh, element where you really need to start to then weigh in what is doable. Uh, what do we know? collecting meaningful information, being aware of biases that exist in the information that's provided to us, and then looking at clear value and trade-off. What consequences do we care about, both negative and positive? What are we willing to live with? And what do we absolutely need to make sure there is no ambiguity in those decisions? And then really checking our thinking. And that can be validated through people who are not part of the process, it can be validated through experts. It can be validated through a, this notion of um, a novice consulting, people who aren't experts in our area, but we bring in, we present potential solutions to them, and we get their reaction to that solution. And ultimately, can we all align and commit to act together? And particularly in the kinds of issues that the industry is facing, the types of, of extreme challenges that, the industry has faced in recent years and will continue to face, it's critical that this cross-industry, cross-government, cross-functional and operational decision-making process is utilized so that there is agreement and these very challenging and difficult issues are addressed in a meaningful way. Ishmael, I think uh, a, a great example has to do with security. Um, indeed, and we asked the question you outlined, Tim, what, is, uh, what are we deciding upon? Security uh, remains uh, an increasing um, area of interest and concern worldwide, among other things, of course. Um, proactive and comprehensive decision-making are just the name of the game in our industry. 
in order to cope with the rising and diverse challenges I mentioned before. Uh, as a concrete example, uh, as Tim mentioned, security in the recent years uh, we have seen growing. Uh, the issue of, uh, of, uh, of uh, sustainable growth with the world economy is definitely jeopardized by security. Uh, terrorists and criminals have long viewed aviation as, as a target for uh, attack and exploitation. The tragic events of September 11 and the Heathrow plot of August 2006 are telling reminders of the threat facing this industry. But airlines are committed to keeping the global sky safe and secure. Uh, so the airlines met as an example and made several important decisions in this area. Uh, the, the decision number one was to uh, institutionalize the government industry cooperation. Once again, what Tim was mentioning, the uh, private public interaction in order to make a very well informed decision, thinking about the key co consequences that, that Tim showed us in his, in his presentation. This would allow security policies to be written with the benefit of airline operational experience. The second decision in the area of secu security was about implementation, recognizing that uh, uh, one-size-fits-all regulation with all numerical targets will not secure a complex global industry. Uh, government must work with uh, industry to define practical implementation measures for their security targets. Uh, the third decision made by, by the airlines was that the passenger data, again, once again, the, anal the analytical point of decision is important, make passenger data collection and sharing more efficient information to break down internal silos and create a single data collection and sharing program that could uh, serve as a model for implementation by other governments. And then we move into the fourth decision, which is harmonized across borders. Governments must talk to each other to ensure that one country's requirement do not conflict with another country's law. We see how we are treated differently from one immigration office to the other around the world, but also from one security checkpoint to the other. And, and, and finally, the next generation checkpoint was agreed upon. Along with optimizing the capabilities of current screening technologies, we must begin to look at uh, future checkpoints that combine technology and intelligence. Uh, we need a checkpoint system that, that focuses on finding bad people, not just bad objects. Uh, the above five critical agreement points show how collective, collaborative decision making is indeed a critical competency for the survival of the industry. Tim? One, one size doesn't fit all. Um, I think that's really a, a critical point when we talk about our next area of competence that's critical for leaders, and that, that's really innovation. Um, increasingly, the challenges we're facing require innovative solutions. And our ability to think into the future, to what if, to, to really challenge creatively uh, ourselves and, and often in an environment that's been built in an industry that's been built on standardization and with good reason. The, it, it's critical that we do extensive risk assessment. It's critical that from an engineering perspective we have some solve some of the most complex engineering problems in the world in this industry. And along with this, this technical rigor also is a requirement that we continue to innovate and think of things in new and different ways. In essence, you know, we, we have to look for creative solutions for problems that haven't even been identified yet. The notion of foresight, creativity. There's a, a, an innovative effort underway at Stanford University around the notion of design thinking, which is really taking a cross-disciplinary approach to challenges not only from a technical perspective and an operational perspective, but bringing in all views in our industry, whether it's the customer, whether it's key stakeholders, whether it's non-traditional uh, areas that we might consider. And then part of this design approach, this design innovative thinking, is to prototype, to, to try things, to, to learn to be quick, 
to try something, gather data, make adjustments, and move on. And that culmination of that prototyping, when strung together, can help create very complex problems in some rather creative ways. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I just wanted to highlight uh, there's a gentleman uh, by the name of Jeffrey Moore who's worked very closely with a number of our Stanford faculty who studied innovation and technology companies in emerging markets. Uh, in fact, his latest book dealing with Darwin was at the request of John Chambers, the CEO of Cisco Systems, to look at innovation. And he really helps us, Moore's work helps us better grasp complexity and what innovation means in a flat world, and that being the world we all operate in, where we are so interconnected regardless of geographical location, and how innovation impacts us all. What can we do to help answer tough questions? You know, what type of innovation would be most strategically important? What evidence will we use to guide the decisions? What decision-making process will we use? Uh, uh, there's some common themes, I think, that you're hearing from Ishmael and I throughout, and, and really, as we look at those leadership challenges and the leadership competencies that are created, it's very difficult to decouple these. They all occur together, and, and it's, it's critical um, that we're, we're thinking holistically about those challenges. But in terms of innovation, just one other quick uh, thought to share with you. What we know from research is that organizations really have four different types of strategic outcomes that they may, may need to consider when they're considering innovation. One is what Moore calls uh, differentiation, and that's how can we be different from our competitors. And many of our individual organizations within the industry are considering those kinds of approaches, differentiate. How might one airline differentiate itself, itself from another? Uh, another approach is, is more refers to as neutralization, and that's really we're simply responding to competitive situations. And, and much of his work is in a, in a highly competitive environment, but there's insight for us because the third area that he recognizes is critical and where a lot of innovation occurs is the, the area of what he calls productivity or enhancing an organization's or an industry's own productivity. And he really discusses this operational excellence as being uh, central to, to an organization's strategy. And, and we feel it's particularly appropriate in the aviation industry and particularly in these cross-industry uh, cross challenges that we're facing. As we're working together, it's critical that we really are looking in the area of, of, of operational excellence for innovative solutions. Unfortunately, the, the fourth area, the red area, uh, most companies only achieve that area. They're really the unwanted uh, uh, time in terms of wasted time and money by focusing on a failed approach. So, so the key around innovation is really to get very clear on what type of strategic outcome you're facing, and then to employ uh, some some creative processes in order to achieve those. Ishmael. Yes. Uh, th thanks for sharing these uh, interesting uh, strategic outcome statistics. Indeed, um, in our industry, and if I focus on the airline in particular. Um, there are not much differences anymore in terms of strategy. At the end of the day, many of them provide almost the same. Uh, what the industry is facing is a lot to do with productivity. Uh, and when I say productivity, is, is uh, the effectiveness and efficiency of the industry. Uh, so despite the, the importance of our industry in connecting the world economy and demonstrating the real meaning of a global village, the matter of fact is that our industry is one of the least profitable ones compared to other industries. Um, in a world where fuel prices, a major cost element as an example, is, is uh, we see uncontrollable, the ability to innovate uh, and think creatively, uh, I'm using your quote term here, is the only way to survive in the, in the air transport industry. Therefore, there is an increasing need to improve efficiency and effectiveness toward uh, increased productivity. Um, let me take an example, uh, which is a uh, uh, program we call Simplifying the Business Initiative. It's a strategic initiative that is all about innovation, thinking uh, um, and traditionally thinking outside the box, trying to cross industries and share best practices from industries even outside the air transport to see why, uh, an, an example, the banking of financial industry is making a lot 
more than our industry. Um, so, so technology has been spotted as one of the key uh, areas where our industry is lagging behind. So this program, Simplifying the Business, um, is aimed to change the way the air transport industry operates, resulting in better services for the passenger as well, at a lower cost for the industry. Uh, the, the program uh, serves the industry up to 18.1 billion every year in terms of cost savings. Um, the program, as I said, emphasizes on the role of technology in accelerating the passenger travel, enhancing the experience of, of a passenger in an airport, despite uh, the rising security measures at the airports, which I have mentioned before. So while the industry needs to focus on the core operational activities, and that's where decision-making is, is an important uh, competency, uh, getting out of the box remains the uh, most important way to uh, survive and uh, go beyond the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, in this norm, uh, two or three initiatives or examples I would like to, to share with you that has been implemented already. One is the uh, electronic ticketing. Today, many of us travel around the world, and maybe some of you, like myself, have traveled in, in the past 10 years and saw that the, the way we're traveling is, is, is very different. We used to print or go to travel agencies, print a ticket, and uh, take a coupon, and if it's lost, it's a big disaster, and then you, you, you basically uh, uh, held hostage for this coupon. Today, the electronic ticketing is available online. You can even upload it in your mobile, uh, check in online, and, and simply uh, uh, present yourself uh, at the security in the airport. Uh, this is one example of how uh, the use of technology has been fundamental to enhance the passenger experience, but also in terms of cost saving. I can tell you a lot about $3 billion has been achieved in terms of, 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 of saving uh, the cost of printing and distributing for the industry in the first year of launch, uh, not to ignore the fact that this is a very environmentally friendly uh, initiative. So the value proposition is clear to all parties involved. Another one is the common use self-service. And this is something you see today in many airports around the world. Uh, you go, you don't need any more to queue in a long uh, line to wait for an officer to, to check you in. You can do that, as I said, online, but also you can use the common use self-service, which is, by the way, an initiative that uh, we borrowed from the banking industry. All of us cash money from the ATM machines. So it's a similar technology we have uh, taken from outside our immediate industry. Uh, these are just examples I wanted to share with you on how important it is to innovate, but also to go outside the box in terms of industry and thinking traditionally. Um, uh, with that, I, I, I give Tim the floor maybe to tell us about execution. Thank, thank you, Ishmael, and, and some great examples of looking outside the industry. You know, at the end of the day, we're all ultimately uh, accountable for execution, for achieving results, for the implementation of the strategy. And there's a variety of ways we do that and a variety of considerations that leaders need to focus on. Uh, project portfolio management, that the notion that work gets done through a series of projects and that, that, that requires an understanding of the criteria. It requires an understanding of the priorities. It requires an understanding of uh, the resources and the funding available to execute on those. And in many cases, deciding it's as important to decide what not to do as it is to decide what to do so that those items that you do choose to focus on are executed effectively. Uh, there's a lot of other issues that come into play when we're looking at actually executing these strategies and implementing the innovative ideas that we come up with. You know, the culture uh, of our organization as well as uh, the culture that's uh, part of our industry and, and uh, uh, nationalistic cultures and the like. Culture is a very complex issue. Uh, typically, we come up with great ideas, and in order to implement those, it requires negotiation. Another key element, uh, a key skill area that's required in order to effectively execute and, and the leader's ability to negotiate with key stakeholders and, and manage others over whom they may not have direct authority but need their support and ultimately tying that into to operations. Um, 
I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail, but I uh, just wanted to let you know another uh, resource that, that we uh, rely heavily on and a significant amount of research that has been done in support of the, the Stanford IATA program is something called the Strategic Execution Framework. And it's a model that really helps describe the link from the ideation, the purpose, the, the long-range intent of an organization or an industry. You know, who are you? What do you stand for? Where are you heading? Uh, and also takes into consideration what we call the nature domain or the issues of culture, of, of structure, and, and based on organizational culture, what is the context in which you are trying to operate and contribute? Uh, the third domain uh, to the right is what we call the vision domain, and that's where we start to translate the ideation, the long the long term kind of vision to a more tactical vision, and we set goals and metrics to measure against. And all of that informs the strategy. What is it that we need to create? And we've talked about vision today. We've talked about strategy. We've, we've uh, uh, looked a bit at portfolio in terms of that is where strategy really gets translated into action. And then through projects and programs and ultimately translating into operations, we identify what it is that we need to to focus on and, and how to execute on that. You know, as a leader looking to effectively implement operational improvements, uh, looking for consistent standards, it's critical to ensure that all these factors listed in the framework are considered and addressed. Uh, we found that one of the, the, the most critical success factors for leaders today is their ability to connect the dots, if you will, to be able to help their their team members, their organizations, and others that they're working with across organization and across industry to really see the linkages from the very highest level, if you will, from the ideation and the vision all the way down to the operational level. Uh, and we'd like to, to, to share one more uh, example of what can happen when all of these domains are in alignment as we operationalize a vision. And our industry is no different from the examples Tim was highlighting and sharing with us. Many of the strategic uh, initiatives fail in our industry because of poor implementation. Um, th there is an importance on strategy thinking and planning as a core competency for the industry, and that's very important because without it we cannot build frameworks. Uh, and we looked at, at the example of the safety management system. Uh, how the airlines met and decided on the key pillars for the safety management system and built that strategy plan. Uh, so why don't we carry on with the same example? And, and I, I can share with you the rest of the story, which is how then that strategy uh, being translated into uh, a reality. So an IATA operational safety audit, we call it IOSA, a program has been designed to manage the implementation of uh, the safety strategy framework by all airlines worldwide using a strict project management methodology for successful implementation. Today, uh, the, 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 the IATA Operation Safety Audit program is an internationally recognized and accepted uh, evaluation system designed to assess the operational management and control system of any airline worldwide. Uh, the principal are designed to conduct audits in a standardized manner, but that requires a rigid and uh, strict project management uh, discipline. Benefiting the aviation industry, so this is this this uh, discipline of execution has has benefited the industry as a whole in reducing uh, the cost uh, of audit and resources required for the airlines and regulators. It also helped continuous updating of the standards to reflect regulatory revisions and the, of course, evolution of best practices within the industry. Um, a quality audit program under the continuing uh, stewardship of IALA, accredited audit organization, who are actually the project management offices, if you want, uh, uh, are trained and, and formally qualified to implement and to audit the standards, an accredited training organization with structure auditors uh, and training courses. This have been a success story, as I mentioned, 
And it's not because we built the strategy, it's also because we took it even a step further and translated it into a real, um, a real action for the industry. Thanks, Ishmael. I, I, so I think in closing uh, around what we've been discussing so far relative to the, the importance and the leader's role, what hopefully we've been able to, to share with you is not only some of those key competencies that are critical, but at the end of the day, what's critical for the leader is to understand the strategy and the direction, to be effective at translating that, and to both inspire their organization and the individuals uh, that they're working with, as well as provide direction and guidance on how to achieve results. And at the end of the day, of course, it's about uh, ensuring the results that we commit to and doing those in a, an effective and, and competent way. So these are just some of the critical competencies for leaders in the industry today. We'd now like to uh, pass the the uh, ball, if you will, back to uh, Carissa, who's going to share a little bit about, a little more about the program uh, that's available to all of you. Well, thank you so much, Tim and Ismail. Um, before I describe a bit about how you can learn more, I'd like to remind you that we will have a Q&A session in just a few moments, so we'd encourage you to please ask uh, questions uh, for both Tim and Ismail um, as we proceed here. So at the Stanford Center for Professional Development, we've been delivering education to industry for over 40 years. And so we have reasonable experience creating educational programs to address the career-long learning needs of professionals, managers, and executives um, in many industries around the world. Uh, we at Stanford are pleased to be offering the Stanford IATA Aviation Management Certificate Program in partnership with IATA's Training and Development Institute. Uh, we believe that the certificate is quite a unique offering because it blends the industry practical experience from experts at IATA and IPS learning with the Stanford theory and research, resulting in a truly rigorous and advanced program that's been de de designed to address the competencies you heard about today and in order to create the future leaders of the aviation industry. We created this program because, as you heard today, whether you work in airline customer service, sales and marketing, network planning, or air transport services, there is a leadership gap in the aviation industry around aligning business management techniques with the specific challenges for that 2050 vision uh, for aviation that you heard about. And you can see here the resulting curriculum. There are three IATA courses focused on aviation and three um, courses from Stanford focused on how to deliver on your business priorities. The program is also delivered via uh, distance learning um, and must be completed within 12 months. And the result of this uh, curriculum is a Stanford Aviation, a Stanford IATA Aviation Management Certificate that's issued jointly by Stanford University, Stanford Center for Professional Development, and IATA, um, as well as an AVMP designation. Now, AVMP holders are required to renew their certification every three years. Um, and we require some additional education, one course from Stanford and one course from IATA to maintain that certification. Here you can see uh, the program uh, curriculum and the required six courses. Um, Air Transport Fundamentals provides a strategic 360 degree view of the industry uh, with airport operations diving into specifics around executing those strategies. Converting strategy into action and mastering the project portfolio will provide a conceptual framework for aligning your business units, uh, specific initiatives with your strategic objectives, and how to ensure that those initiatives have the right resources and can be completed on time. Airline revenue management provides strategies for pricing and decision making to optimize revenues. Um, and Leadership for Strategic Execution addresses key leadership challenges for those responsible for executing uh, strategies while faced with change, a problem ever so common in air transport. Uh, what we tried to do in creating this program was offer courses via very flexible delivery options, so you can access them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and these are available uh, both via ebook and online via streaming video. Um, you'll also find some contact details and some pricing information here, and we encourage you to uh, send us email or, or ask us questions. And so now we'd like to take a moment to conduct a poll. If you could please, uh, we'd really appreciate your feedback, if you could indicate your level of interest 
in the Stanford IATA certificate, um, we'd really appreciate it. Okay, I think we've got some uh, some good responses. Thank you so much. And with that, um, I'd like to uh, uh, facilitate our question and answer period here. Um, so uh, if uh, Tim or Ismail can answer this question for me, does this framework apply to all professions within the industry um, and to all management levels? Um, I can maybe, Tim, if you allow me, I can answer that one. Absolutely. Um, so so uh, thanks for the question, uh, Chris. I think it's, um, it applies to all professions, whether, whether it's, uh, it's, uh, it's someone who works in an airport, uh, airline, uh, civil aviation authority from a regulation point of view, uh, ground handling company, even, even I would say cargo or even travel agency. Um, this applies to everybody because the model, as you saw, is about developing a human capital in an industry that is more in need of anyone else, I think, air transport. Now, does it apply to all level of, uh, of, uh, of professions? Um, I would say yes, with different concentration and focus on the different areas. So if you are an entry-level profession, you, you don't need necessarily to, to focus a lot on the strategy or uh, the leadership. You need to understand them, uh, contribute to them, uh, but maybe your role would be more into the execution and and uh, decision making and the other elements. So you need to look at this with with uh, with uh, a clear understanding, but also map to your own reality uh, and try to develop them all at the same time if possible. Thank you, Ismail. So um, one other question here. Is, um, we have a couple more questions. Where does the responsibility for portfolio management sit within an organization? I'll, I'll address that, Carissa. You know, portfolio management, it, it really varies by, by uh, organization. Uh, some organizations at the more strategic executive level uh, will focus on identifying strategy and then beginning to uh, identify how to break that strategy down and, and build a portfolio. Uh, in other organizations, there's a waterfall approach that's utilized whereby that strategy is articulated up and down the organization and then uh, individuals and organizations from throughout uh, provide their requests, if you will, uh, their, their uh, aspects to executing on those key strategic initiatives and, and the projects and the programs that would be required to execute on those. Uh, at the end of the day, what, what we know is, is critical there are a couple of factors. One, that there is a clearly defined and understood portfolio process that's as critical as determining uh, and clearly defining who the owner is of that process. But uh, there, there's something called fair process that's a concept that suggests that if people believe that the process used to make decisions, particularly portfolio decisions about where to focus efforts uh, on investments and, and activities, if there's a belief that that is a fair and equitable process that key stakeholders all have a say in that and that there's some clearly identified criteria that's articulated and is very uh, transparent to an organization, then uh, those are some of the key elements uh, required for an effective portfolio process. I guess the last thing I'd say is that uh, we, we have lots of examples where uh, even uh, individual leaders or managers all the way down to an individual project level employ some best practices around portfolio management in order to make decisions about resources and what they will focus on and prioritization. So it is something that can be applied at many levels in the organization. Thank you, Tim. So our final question, I believe, is for Ismail. So how does this program differentiate itself uh, from the AMPAP offered by ACI and ICAO? Sure. So. Um, all of us together collectively, because we work all in the same industry, uh, and as I mentioned, we work closely with uh, ICAO. The uh, objective is to develop human capital, but in different ways. So the, the, the program we are having is addressing the wide spectrum of the air transport industry. So it's, as you saw when Carissa was presenting the curriculum, we're addressing airports, but not only airports, airlines, 
and the 360 degree view on the air transport fundamentals. On the other hand, uh, the, the, the program, uh, which is actually called, uh, for people who doesn't know uh, what is it, it's the Airport Management Professional Accreditation Program. Uh, from the name, it focuses on mainly airport-related uh, competencies. Uh, so uh, they are both aiming at the same objective, which is to develop a human capital. Uh, ours is more industry-wide. Uh, this one is focused on the airport profession itself. Uh, Carissa? Well, thank you, uh, Tim and Ismail. I'm, I'm sensitive to time here, and I, I, I've noted that there are a number of questions still in the queue, and so we'll continue to stay online and answer those via chat. Um, but I just I wanted to remind you, first I want to thank Tim and Ismail for a great presentation today. I wanted to remind you that you may now print a PDF of the slides uh, by selecting a print to PDF option in the lower navigation bar. Um, and remember to look for um, an email uh, that will alert you when this webinar is available to watch online. Um, you can feel free to share it with others. Um, and so I'd, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate your time and uh, uh, hope you have a good uh, morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you so much.